Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, friends in fiction. If it is Wednesday night at 7 p.m., it's usually time for our show. But we are on break between seasons. Yet, we could not resist popping in tonight to celebrate the paperback release of Surviving Savannah that was just released on April 5th. At the Savannah Book Festival, I gathered my friends and fiction, ladies and gent, in Savannah, Georgia, at the Ships of the Sea Maritime Museum. I am Patty Callahan. Join me with Christy, Kristen, Meg, and Ron as we talk about why the artifacts of our life really matter. We'll show some of the treasure from the shipwreck that was found at the bottom of the sea after almost 200 years. And we'll talk about some of the things we've saved in our own lives that someone else might throw away. Discovering untold stories is like having a great secret whispered in your ear. And this story was one of those secrets. Surviving Savannah was inspired by the true and forgotten to time saga of a luxury steamship with the nickname, the Titanic of the South. Only four women survived this catastrophe and I wanted to tell their stories. I explored the role of fate, family histories, and the myriad ways we survived the surviving, along with the backdrop of the beloved and mystical Savannah. Now join us as we talk about the things we save and why. Hi everyone. Here we are at the Ships of the Sea Museum in Savannah, Georgia, and we are celebrating the surviving Savannah paperback. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we had some champagne. <laughs> and instead, we have artifacts. Yeah. Instead, we have artifacts coming out on April 5th. This, as you know, is our friends and fiction crew. I am Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Meg Walker. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Kristen Harbell. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. And I'm Ron Block. And we are friends in fiction. Four New York Times bestselling authors, a rock star librarian, a guru Meg Walker who keeps us in shape and on the rails. It keeps us from being a hot mess express. She tries. She tries. It doesn't always happen. And we are here to talk about the paperback and about artifacts and about the things we save and why we save them. So this is a special episode because once upon a time, 184 years ago, Passengers boarded this ship, the SS Pulaski, to sail north for the summer. Over 200 passengers were on board. They expected only one night at sea. They expected a lovely trip. But what we expect and what we get are rarely the same things. And they boarded with their baubles and their jewelry, and their artifacts, and their religious reliquaries, ladles. and their luggage, <laughs> and their ladles, <laughs> and their luggage tags, and they boarded expecting to be on the other side in Baltimore, Maryland, with all of these things. But that's not what happened. 30 miles off the coast of North Carolina, the starboard boiler went dry, and the second engineer poured cold water into a steaming hot boiler, creating a bomb, and the ship exploded. It took 45 minutes to sink. And the stories of survival, especially through the two eyes of my characters, are astounding. Some of them floating for five days and five nights at sea. But how could they know that the things that mattered to them ended up on the bottom of the ocean? So I thought we would talk a little bit about the things we save and the artifacts that matter to us. 
and why we save them. Because it doesn't make sense why the things that we save matter so much to us. For example, I have here with me a story that I wrote in fourth grade. Every time I clean out my files, I think I should get rid of it. What does it matter that I save it anyway? Do not panic, I will not read it to you. <laughs> we'll tell you how it started. One day, a girl named Susie went to a new school for the first time. It's a pretty good opening line for a fourth grader. It's a grammar line. I know, right? So I want to hear one. And then what happened? Yeah. You have us, we're hooked. We're hooked. Can you please keep reading? So I want to know some of the artifacts you've kept in your life that every time you go to look at them, you think, I should get rid of that. I should throw that away. But you don't. Oh, well, I never think I should throw it away, but um, one thing that I keep close to me is this ring that I have of my grandmother's. Um, when, she, when she was alive, she wore it all the time. And as a child, I thought it was sort of silly because it's large and it felt big and yes. ostentatious or something. But when she died, I wanted it just so that I had a piece of her. And then years and years later, cocktail rings came in style, and I thought, I have one of those. <laughs> I it's dug it out of my dresser, and now I wear it all the time. I wear it when I want to feel the strength of her close to me. And it's so weird because it doesn't make sense, right? Like, yeah. It's a, it's a ring. There's nothing. Even the stone has been replaced. Like, wow. it's not the same it's, ring, really, but it is to me. It means something, yeah. And so if you went on, a say, a steamship? North for the summer, you would have brought it with you. Absolutely, I would. Right? Yes. So we do yeah. these things. We I might not have brought my ladle, but no. I would definitely but that's not, But if it was 1838, and we're going to talk about these in a second, but if it was 1838, you might have brought your ladle. Yeah, right? sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. No, no. How about you? Well, speaking of fourth grade, that made me think of something that I've never been able to get rid of. I am not one to like keep up with, I don't keep schoolwork or anything like that, not even of my sons, although he notices sometimes. But in the fourth grade, we did something called a North Carolina project. And I think every fourth grader did it and they still do it. And I just have never been able to get rid of it because it was something that, like I interviewed so many people in my family for it. And I talked to so many people, um, you know, in my life about all these different things that had to do with North Carolina, which is the state where I'm from. And so I just always kept it. And it's so funny how now, my son's in fourth grade. He's doing his own North Carolina project. And I was actually able to share mine with him. And it made me realize how many things I had written about in the fourth grade that like, I'm still interested in now or like showing up in my stories yeah. all these years later. So it's like your story here. It's funny how the things that we're thinking about as children you know, show up in our adult lives. And, and if you hadn't saved it, I you wouldn't have seen those echoes. Yeah. All right, yeah. Miss Kristen. You know, it's interesting, Meg, that you mentioned your grandmother, um, because I think we all just have such an attachment mm -hmm. to these yeah. people who came before us, who kind of paved the way for us and played a huge role in making us who we are. Um, so for me, it would also be something for my grandmother, which um, I have such distinct memories of sitting on her lap while she read me the book, Gus Was a Friendly Ghost, which <laughs> um, was an old book that I think she read to my mom when my mom was a little girl. Um, she read it to me when I was a little girl, and it was one of the things um, that I got to take after my grandmother died. I was really close to my grandmother, um, and I have it, and you know, it's funny that you said, you think about, you know, should this really be here? Should I move it? Should I get rid of it? Do I need to keep Do this? Does it matter? I would never throw it away, but it sits on the bookshelf. It sits behind me every night. Yeah. You watch Friends in Fiction, and it doesn't belong, because everything else there is new. Um, but it's that piece of the old that became who I am today. Yeah, so oh. that's, that's the thing for me. About How about you, Mary Fan? Well, you know, unlike everybody else, I am a hoarder. <laughs> I'm a hoarder too. Shocking. <laughs> what? My, um. I didn't know. What? I was supposed to know. My late mother on her honeymoon, my, my father was in the Air Force. And he was stationed in England. So on their honeymoon, they got to go all over Europe. And everywhere she went, she would buy a souvenir spoon. And I guess they're about, what we used to take them to show and tell at school, you know, oh, look, this is from, you know, Switzerland or Bath, England. Um, and so when she passed away about, um, oh, 18 or 19 years ago, I kept the spoons and I have some of them mounted in a, in a shadow box. Oh, that's so awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, anybody who knows me knows that I am very at home in the kitchen and continuing the grandmother. Which is why you get to hold the utensils. Yes. So, so continuing the grandmother theme, um, 
when my grandmother passed, I, I raided her kitchen and I have still her old antique potato masher oh and some ruby plates and um, her pie dish that she used all the time, which I don't oh. dare use now because ovens will probably blow it up. But, yeah. but I won't get rid of them because there's still a connection that um, I've learned to cook from her. So it's this old connection that comes down yeah, a generation. Great. And she, she held it um, long ago and I hold it now. So it's a great connection. It's amazing. It's fascinating because when um, I was doing the research for the Pulaski and I discovered that they had discovered the ship, you know, 30 miles, right. you know, off the coast of North Carolina, 100 feet deep. What was interesting to me at first was that the, the shipwreck itself. But as you start to see these artifacts and, and things that have been at the bottom of the ocean, you imagine somebody boarding the ship with their silver, yeah. right? And I became so obsessed with wanting to know who. It took me a year and a half, but I figured out who it belonged to. So the silver that y'all are holding, nobody from that pair, from that family survived. Oh my goodness. And we don't know about this beautiful religious reliquary, but somebody went on board saying, this is important to me. Right. And there were a lot of Catholics in Savannah. Yes. So probably, you know, reliquary, sometimes you put a little place here and you have holy water to bless yourself. And candle, I think votives also went Probably, in there. Yeah, votives went in there. And then this luggage tag is from the character I wrote about. And when I was halfway through the book and I wanted to give up, Micah Eldred, the man who heads up the company that is bringing up the artifacts and treasure, sent me a picture of this luggage tag with the name of my main character. Her real name is, it's so crazy. And it's right now the only luggage bag they found. Her name is Rebecca Lamar. But I saw to keep going. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You all told me to keep going, but Rebecca really told yeah, me. She yeah, she did. So thanks for celebrating with us, and may every memory you save be a good memory. And buy her book, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am in the Ships of the Sea Maritime Museum in Savannah, Georgia, next to the full-scale model of the Pulaski. Discovering untold stories is like having a great secret whispered in your ear. And this story is one of those secrets. My new novel, Surviving Savannah, is inspired by the true and forgotten to time saga of a luxury steamship with the nickname the Titanic of the South but her real name was the steamship Pulaski. Here in Savannah, Georgia, on the river's wharf, one balmy June morning in 1838, this beautiful ship set sail and began its three-day journey to Baltimore. It was to dock overnight in Charleston and pick up more passengers, and then it was to be only one night at sea until reaching the north. This was part of the ship's allure, a luxury ship with only one night at sea to escape the cruel southern summers. She was the talk of the town. She had already made three journeys and everyone expected an easy and luxurious trip. But what we expect and what we get are rarely the same and thus the makings of a story. In the middle of the night on June 14th, with close to 200 passengers on board, this steamship exploded off the coast of North Carolina. About one third of the passengers and crews survived. When I learned about this little known story, I was immediately fascinated because I realized how close to home it was right here in my towns of Savannah, Georgia and Bluffton, South Carolina, and how its tale had never been fully told. I was three weeks into my research tinkering with the idea, researching local families and plotting when I sat down one early morning at my desk and hit on a headline. Pulaski wreck found by Endurance Exploration. A shipwreck hunting company had found the Pulaski at the bottom of the sea, 100 feet deep, 30 miles off the coast of Wilmington, North Carolina. Chills ran up my neck. While I was researching the story, they were researching the sea. My exhilarating hunt for the forgotten story began. While the ship's artifacts, gold, silver, pocket watches, and treasure were being discovered and brought to the surface, I rushed here to the Ships of the Sea Maritime Museum 
to see the ship's model and find information, and then to the Georgia Historical Society in Savannah to sift through the ancient papers, trying to find the full truth of that calamitous night. What I discovered, among many other tales, was the story of a very real Savannah family who brought me closer to the tragedy. In my novel, they are renamed the Longstreet family. A father with his wife, six children, sister, and niece who traveled on this ship, and not everyone survived. But among those who did survive was the oldest son, a 14-year-old boy named Charles. He spent five harrowing days and nights at sea, not only living through the hell, but also helping others to survive, earning him the nickname, the noble boy. And then here's the kicker, 25 years later, that same boy, now a man, had a new nickname, the Red Devil. He became a cruel slave importer and trader. He also joined the Fire Eaters as a rabble rouser for the Civil War. In a short 20 years, this saved child had transformed from noble boy to Red Devil. And this is when I knew what the story was really about. How do we survive the surviving? Who do we choose to become after tragedy? After years of research, reading, writing, and digging, I finally put together the events of that doomed journey. With a dual timeline and a modern day museum curator designing an exhibit of the artifacts, alongside the stories of the Longstreet family in 1838, I look much closer at our collective ideas that survival merits some kind of worthiness, that everything happens for a reason, and that our lives are destined to end up in certain ways. All with the backdrop of the beloved and mystical city of Savannah, then and now. I hope you love this story as much as I do. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here.